Bill Pat? Historically speaking. Historically speaking. Uh, how long have you been collecting the history of Hutchinson? Oh, basically since about 1980. About 1980. But with a great deal of enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, before we get into this, are any of those tiles still available? I'm not really sure. If there are, there's only a very few. Crossroads didn't have any the other day. And it would be a matter of going from business to business or calling downtown development office and asking them if there are any out. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, as we talk about the history of Hutchins this morning, and we'll encourage uh, people to call with questions or additions, too, as Pat gets started. First of all, I did hear Dan Deming promise the history of chocolate this week. No. I'm not going to get into that. As I started putting things together here, not ever having done a 30-minute show, I wasn't sure how much material, but I suspect I've got way too much anyway. But I will share with you that chocolate was originally thought to be an aphrodisiac, which may be why we give chocolate on Valentine's Day. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And I will give you the history of chocolate at some point. Um, there's a book called The Devil's Dictionary, and I'll tell you later where these came from, these definitions. But the idea for this show is education, but entertainment and fun. And they're welcome to call in any time. I don't know when your period is. Will it be right halfway through? Is this? Oh, well, anytime, anytime they want to call. Okay. We're, we're kind of loose here, Pat. We can just kind of break in okay. between while you're talking. Okay. And you use the party line number if you have any questions or additions to add to the minutes. That to the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. And, Ambrose Bierce is the one credited for the definitions in the Devil's Dictionary, and his definition of entertainment is any kind of amusement whose inroads stop short of death by dejection. And that, that is one of our goals for this show, and we could perhaps use the word rejection, I don't know. When I was on the radio with Sam Thursday, on the way out here, I had the thought about, because they're debating about the live rabbits for the dog races. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't looked up any of the facts on it, but I did share with him that morning that we did have greyhound races here with the rabbits. We bred the rabbits for them. And I thought, since that is so current right now, that maybe it would have been interesting to talk a little further. Okay. So we had an M.E. Allison. He was a druggist, grocer, miller, traveling salesman, landowner, and at one time he was part owner of the water power mill, which is where Stevens Plumbing used to be on South Main. In 1883, he established kennels here with two dogs, Sandy Jim and Reno Bell. They were full-blooded English greyhounds. And he bred them, and the, the main aim at that time was to chase large game, antelope, deer, wolves, that sort of thing. But the fame of his dogs spread all over the country. It was rumored that no animal could even outrun them. There were a lot of articles about the dogs, even as far away as in the London papers. Some of them he wrote himself. Oh, my. And the names of the dogs were what again? Sandy Jim and Reno Bell. Okay. <laughs> they even... Um, a sketch artist came out and went into Indian territory with he and his dogs, and they ran a series of articles on them. But because of this, the first dog and rabbit racing meet ever held in the United States was held at Cheyenne Bottoms in 1886. My goodness, that's not very far away. No, not really. And the Hutchinson dogs won three of their four races. Apparently, those were, were well attended, because then shortly after, July 1888, with Allison assisting, they organized the National Coursing Association here in Hutchinson. It was the first in the US, United States. It was capital stock, had capital stock of $50,000, which was put up by Hutchinson men, New York men, St. Louis, Louisville, and Topeka. And they planned their first race for October that year. Have you gone in here to where the race was held? Are we getting uh -huh. to that? Okay. We're getting to a good part here. Okay. They bought a half section of land for an enclosed track. See, back then, when they had something they thought was the first, they said the first. I guess it's harder to find first now, maybe, you know. But this was supposed to be the first enclosed track in the United States, and they had rabbit pins. If anyone one wants to go to the library, the July 8, 1888 paper on microfilm has a drawing of this track. They were going to place 1,000 jackrabbits in the pin for 1888, and they figured they were going to have 5,000 by 1889. I could tell you about the bunny in our backyard if you want to know how rabbits breed. <laughs> I haven't had to worry about my crocus this year, I can tell you. This was a three-quarter mile track, 200 yards wide, two grandstands with a seating capacity of 10,000. My land, back was then, in yes. 1888. Yeah, and so they had in, um, let's see, the end of October 1888, they had their first one. And the beginning of October 1889, we had a second one, and they even closed the downtown businesses on the third day. Uh, which, where from Hutchinson was this? You know which direction? Uh-huh. It's where the Dillon's Bakery is. They're on 3rd? No, a way out there at Halstead and 4th. Halstead and 4th. Yeah. It, according to, of course you have to realize the roads weren't necessarily exactly where they are now, but yeah. it was right there on that corner. 
and it was a half section, so I would say the Dillon Bakery is on the east side of it, probably. That open field there would be basically where it was. I often wondered if people with metal detectors went out there if they'd find coins. But nonetheless, I don't know. <laughs> <No. laughs> you, you just Bakery. asked all your listeners, didn't you? <laughs> uh, Dillon's Bakery. I, I, I don't know where the Dillon's complex is. Okay, it? the bakery's on the west side of the complex. Okay, okay. Okay. There's the bakery and then Jackson's ice cream and then the warehouse. That's okay, so it's uh, the west end of the Dillon complex right. out there. I suspect Dillon's owned the land clear to Halstead. I imagine so. Yeah. I don't know. And this is where the racetrack and they had how uh, the stands held how many people? A uh, capacity of ten thousand total. And they must have been widely attended to have closed the businesses downtown that second one. You see. I mean oh, they where they get ten thousand people. Well, they came from all over. It wasn't just Hutchinson people. Did they bet? I don't know. <laughs> don't you imagine they did? Well, I can't imagine a race, you know, without betting. I can't either. Of course, I can't imagine one without a live rabbit either. I, I, they show them on TV, and they're, they're dragging this stuffed thing along, and the dogs probably chase it, though. Oh, yes. We and saw it, that in Yuma this winter we went in. Yeah, and it does seem cruel. Not the way I feel about my bunny this morning after looking at my clothes. <laughs> it doesn't seem cruel, but it does. It does seem cruel. Mm -hmm. Then I lost, I didn't run on to any more that were held in Hutch. They began holding them in Great Bend. So, in fact, in October of 1888, same year, we had our first one on October 15th. They also had one at Great Bend. And they had a group there called the American Coursing Club. Hmm. And I think Great Bend must have held them longer than we did. I ran on to one in October of 1891 at Great Bend. There were 46 dogs entered. In October of 1905 at Chapman, Kansas, there were 600 greyhounds. Now, Allison, about the turn of the century, sold his kennels and got out of the, the whole thing. And, and you I, think that then that they had these races all this time? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I do. Uh, well, if you put up stands for 10,000 people, you've got quite an investment. You do. You do. I wonder if there's any of our listeners out there this morning that in any of your books or letters or something that you have at home that has that you have any knowledge of this this racing back in this time. Uh, I wish you'd call us. You can talk to Pat about it if any yeah, of your ancestors... Take some notes, right. If any of your ancestors have ever spoken or you have information regarding this, okay? And somebody who might have their interest piqued by this wants to go to the library, and they seem to have been held in October pretty consistently. It could be that if you would go through every year successively and check the papers in October, like the Hutch News is, you may find one mentioned. You could tell then perhaps how long. But I was surprised how near into present day they were held. Now, I ran onto a clipping in 1939. They were to revive coursing on Cheyenne Bottoms, quote, where Custer's dogs raced. <laughs> because they said it was 53 years ago last fall, October 29th and 31st, 1886, that the first course, no, that's that one I mentioned, the first coursing meet held in America. Um, they said at Old Fort Dodge in 1869, General Custer had a pack of English greyhounds. And when he left that fort, he turned him over to his lieutenant, Jim Kelly, one of the scouts. Uh, the first futurity winner in America was supposed to have been a dog named the Duke of Dodge, raised by Dr. O.H. Simpson. And the first futurity, am I saying that right, futurity race held in Great Bend in 1890. My goodness, here we're back talking about racing. Years 1929, National Course Meet held at Dodge City, 1,650 dogs. That was a big one. Then I ran into a clipping in 1940 that they were to hold two of them here in 41 on the fairgrounds. Does anyone remember those? Now, somebody listening could well remember those. Now, I, since didn't, uh, it was December 41 when Pearl Harbor was bombed. That's so I suspect they held those two races. And when was that supposed to have been? They were supposed to have been in April and October of 1941. And they said then that Abilene had had them for the past eight years. But don't they That's still the have a... Where is in there still a, a, a Greyhound uh, racetrack at Abilene? There probably is. And didn't I hear on the radio the other day there's somebody up there that breeds them a large kennel or something. Mm -hmm. But in 1940, Abilene had had them for the past eight years, and we were to have them in 41. Here at the fairgrounds? At the fairgrounds. Hmm. Huh should remember that but i sure don't yeah well and i also i also put out what i called a hook to sam uh -huh. that, ma that makes me a hooker don't you realize oh my that well what can i say and i asked people i said uh, we had a building here in, in hutchinson that was a kissing cousin to the empire state building the pentagon 
Yale University, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, Grand Central Station, Metropolitan Museum of Art, NBC Building, and the interior of the Lincoln Memorial. Do you have any idea what building that is? The courthouse? How'd you know, Perky? I didn't know. <laughs> you guessed, right? I guess. Is that true? It's true. The, you don't have, uh, regarding our courthouse, uh, we were uh, down in South Hutch visiting my sister. The, uh, no, it was the bowling alley. We had bowling alley. And we were coming back, or it was nighttime. Had they just recently put lights on the top of the courthouse to call our attention to it? Have they recently no, redone know, something? Perky. But from a distance, coming from the bowling alley there south, you could see this beautiful top of the courthouse and I haven't noticed it coming from the bowling alley before maybe I just haven't been observant but I thought how beautiful and Dean remarked look at that isn't that pretty so mm, I, well, I had never noticed any on it before either so maybe they have good uh, I guess well it's just uh, last week in fact last Wednesday um, coming home at nine o'clock I here's this beautiful lighted courthouse I don't know has it been lit like that before I've never noticed it well, we did, and so that's the only reason it came to mind. Yeah. We just saw it last week. I have found, to me, that courthouse just looks like a courthouse. I never thought too much about it one way or the other, but people seem to either love it or hate it, building-wise. You well, know, the style and all. Well, the top of it is beautiful. Yeah. Uh, do we have, oh, I don't know if she's talking, and they're coming in on our line at 35055. I don't know if they're questions for you or not. Well, evidently not. So well, if anyone remembers those races in 41. All right, we'd like for someone who, remember, that isn't that old. Not you know. really. Somebody listening could have gone to those. All right, if you went to the races of the fairgrounds in 1941, would you call us at 35055? We certainly are. Nobody told her. Nobody told her. <laughs> right. Oh, my goodness, there she goes drinking again. <laughs> we are asking people. We are asking. No, no we're, we're not a regular party line. We're not a regular party line. We're an irregular party line. And on Tuesday mm -hmm. mornings between 10.30 and 11, well, no, not party line calls. Just about dog racing right now. Just about questions concerning history, and we want to know about dog racing in Hutchinson right now. Thank you. But you may call 35055. That's, that's what's nice about here is the organization. Isn't this this is how I run my home. I, you know, there's no problem. We're put together by a committee out here, that's for sure. Okay, go ahead. Would you like me to share with you why this building is a kissing cousin? I certainly would. Now, it's a kissing cousin back to what building? Even the Empire State Building, Pentagon, Yale University, the Military Academy at West Point, Grand Central Station, Metropolitan Museum of Art, NBC building, and the interior of the Lincoln Memorial. All right. This is because in southern Indiana, there is a band of limestone that geologists call the Salem outcrop. It's the richest and most accessible deposit of limestone in the world, supporting the largest concentration of quarries on Earth. The vein is five to six miles wide, averaging 120 feet deep, snaking through the hills and the hollows of Monroe and Lawrence counties. The first quarry opened there in 1827, and they used the stone just in that area until the railroads came. There is a huge hole there called the Empire Hole. The Empire, and now Empire what state hole. is this again? This is Indiana. Indiana. Which was abandoned, but that's where all the limestone came for the Empire State Building in, in the 30s. And the Reno County Courthouse, which was built in 1930-31, the little promotional booklet that came out when they had their opening, gray, it's made of gray buff brick and about 50 carloads of Indiana limestone. Very, very interesting. Have we completed this particular segment? Yes, that would be fine. So we all right. I think it's time then that we have our pet patrol, if that's all right. That's we're, not, right. we're not going to uh, watch about do greyhounds and rabbits, but we do have some other missing pets, so we'll have those right now. Time again for the BW Radio Pet Patrol, a community service of your local veterinarian to help reunite lost or strayed pets with their owners. Brought to you in part by Apple Lane Animal Hospital, 2911 Apple Lane. And by the Hutchinson Small Animal Hospital, 1201 East 30th. On the pet patrol this morning, a found dog. It's a female half-grown Dalmatian, white with black spots, of course. No collar. Found at uh, 613 West 15th. Call 665-6449. 665-6449. And lost, a Sitsu, it's white, uh, blind in one eye, answers to the name of Bear, no collar. There is a reward for the return of this animal. It's missing from 503 West 22nd. Call 669-9945, 669-9945. Unknown until about 20 years ago, feline leukemia virus is now regarded as the leading cause of pet-cat deaths. Cats persistently infected rarely live more than three years and most die of associated disease before cancers develop. 
In 1984, Norton Laboratories developed the first federally licensed feline leukemia virus vaccine. Now cats can be protected against the many forms of suffering associated with and caused by feline leukemia virus infection. We now have the ability to test cats for and vaccinate cats against feline leukemia. Your cat's health may be dependent on this procedure. Please contact your veterinarian for further information. If you have a missing or found pet, call the BW Pet Patrol at 662-4486. We'll broadcast that announcement free Monday through Saturday at 1045 on the party line. It's another way BW Radio and your local veterinarian serve the community. Brought to you in part by South Hutchinson Animal Clinic, 515 West Blanchard, and Westside Veterinary Clinic, 1730 Nickerson Boulevard. Okay, we're back now. We're still uh, interested if there's anyone that attended uh, the great, is it Greyhound races? We've been Greyhound races. In 1941 at the fairgrounds where we're discussing uh, paramutual betting and racetracks and so forth. If you attended or know anything, and man, I'm sure there's many of you there, that isn't many, that many years ago, uh, that attended uh, the races there at the fairgrounds, call us at 35055. We'd like to hear what you have to say. Now, we will go on, but you're welcome to break in anytime. Yes, and I'm going to talk a little further now about the Devil's Dictionary. The Devil's Dictionary. Yeah, now what this, this was based on a series of weekly newspaper columns written by an Ambrose Bierce, B-I-E-R-C-E, which began in 1881, but he didn't write them regularly. And if you read his definitions, he sounds very independent anyway. But later they were put into a book titled The Cynic's Word Book. There were several reprint, reprints in the 1940s. Mine is one. I bought it at a flea market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get treasures there. In the front, mine says the original copyright was 1911, titled The Devil's Dictionary. Now, it's been reprinted by Dover Books. So I'll give you another definition. His definition of ability. The natural equipment to accomplish some small part of the member meaner ambitions distinguishing able men from dead ones. <laughs> Why not? Abscond to, quote, move in a mysterious way, end quote, commonly with the property of another. Okay. Like that. Yeah, just another way to say <laughs> abscond, I guess. Okay. Okay. Um, I enjoy, I buy a lot of books like that, old ones, and especially the old ones, and paperbacks. Uh, this is a dictionary of misinformation. This isn't necessarily his history, but when you think about it, we, can, we worry so much about the pollution in the air, and maybe everybody out there knew this but me, but raindrops will not form in a completely unpolluted atmosphere. Did you know that? Raindrops will not form in, in a completely unpolluted atmosphere. In other words, we have to have some pollution or we would have no rain. Hmm. Hmm. And this book also said that the words all men are born free and equal is not written in either the U.S. Constitution or the De Declaration of Independence. Had you ever heard that? No. I hadn't either. Okay. That's what, that's what the... Well, I know, and you know, a person maybe shouldn't send out these little things, except that it does make you stop and think. You know, is it or is it not? That book could be wrong. Declaration of Independence, doesn't it say that all men are... Well, of course, it was Lincoln that said whether that all men are created equal. Yeah, I think it was, yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe well, it isn't in the Declaration of Independence, I just presumed it was. People, if you have that, you can get up and look yeah, it up. Yeah, you can look that up in, on the way to the library that follows through the, the dog races. And, of course, we're all sick of, the, of this Tower Commission thing. But I was reading a thing the other day about scandals in the White House in the past. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Now, this, this is historically speaking. Now, Grover Cleveland, while he was still a bachelor, and before he was president, he fathered an illegitimate son by a widow lady friend of his. Well, what can I say, Perky? But being a man of principles, he willingly signed the papers and agreed to care for this child. Of course, now, when he ran for the presidency, the opponents dug this all up, as men are, you know, want to do. And so they, his opponents created the slogan, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? Gone to the White House. Ha, ha, ha. But he won anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what year was that? Uh, I don't know. He's the one I did look up. I looked up the president's, the rate uh, the years the pre other presidents were in here, but I didn't look his what up. What was that slogan again? Ma, Ma, where's my pa? Gone to the White House. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. And this would have been Grover Cleveland. Oh, mercy. <laughs> now, see, I'd, right here I have John Adams, and I looked his up before I left this morning. I had 1797 to 1801 for John Adams. 
He was supposed to have been accused of sending large sums of money to the Barbary pirates of North Africa for protection. That was one of his. Hmm. And he had another one. Congress had appropriated $25,000 to refurbish the White House. And Adams was accused of spending only six and pocketing the rest. Obviously. So, uh, really, all this scandal that we're supposed to have in the White House these days is... Well, if they had had all the news media coverage... That oh, we heavens. Had, they had a <laughs> That's plan. true. And each one that comes up, like the one with Reagan right now, you know, everybody's so involved in it, like we were with Nixon a few years ago, and practically every president's had some, so, you know. I ran onto one for James Garfield, and it was called the Star Route Fraud. And what it basically was, they had contractors in Washington who had placed bids on the 9,000 or more star routes, which were your rural routes, basically, that had to be delivered by stagecoach or, hor or horses. And they would then sublet these bids to individuals in the areas. But some of those in Washington who were awarded the contracts would then appeal for more funds, calling them cost overruns. The scandal broke when the assistant postmaster asked for an additional $1,700,000, and it was estimated that over $4 million had already been paid out for supposed cost overruns. When President uh, Garfield ordered an investigation, said he was going to look into it himself, and three days later he was assassinated. Now, isn't that odd? After he was getting ready to look into it. He said, yeah, it was going, he, they, were, they were investigating it, it was going too slowly, and he made a, a public speech and said he was looking into it himself personally, and three days later he was assassinated. Did you ever find out who killed him? I don't know. Did they? Uh, Dave's shaking his head up now. Do you know who killed him? Do you know? David must know. Can't think of the man's name. It was uh, some immigrant that, uh, you know, was uh, kind of an off-the-wall type I suppose terrorist type individual that uh, was convicted and I think ultimately executed for that. That wouldn't have had anything to do then with well, the postal thing. Well, this particular article I took this from inferred that it did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. When you when you look up something like this, there is no stopping place. Oh, I can. You see know, that. you could go on from there and find out the man's name. You could go on and find out what he did, and you know, it could take. You could go on forever with it. And even old Teddy Roosevelt, you know, he was here a couple times. Yes. Yes, he was. He was quite upset. He is that when we, we put the thing out on rails here? Oh, that's well, hard. That's hard. hard. This, yeah. is, this is back further than that. Okay. Yeah. Supposedly, there's a legend that he visited a family here in town regularly, and I have a postcard that shows Teddy and his family sitting on a front lawn, and so little shows of the house, you can't recognize it. And supposedly, it's a house here, and I've never been able to find out for sure. But the New York World and the Indianapolis News both had smear campaigns against poor old Teddy, mostly relating to his handling of the building the Panama Canal. And Teddy sued for libel, but guess what? The federal court ruled in favor of the newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, then there was Warren, Warren Harding's Teapot Dome scandal after he, after he died in 1923, which is your monument out there. From what this article uh, said, and I can hear my father uh, using that term teapot dome scandal, and I never knew what it was at all, so I'm not versed on this at all. But simply put, there were apparently two millionaire oil men, Sinclair and Doheny, D-O-H-E-N-Y. They were allowed to lease certain large oil reserves, which had previously been under control of the Navy Department. And the major oil reserve was at that time in Teapot Dome, Wyoming, where's where the name comes from. The, both the oil men were placed on trial in 1929 on bribery charges. Both were found not guilty, but the Secretary of the Interior was found guilty of accepting the bribe. Which okay. is kind of how you could, they were not guilty, but he was. My goodness. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a pause and you have a call. So we'll, uh, oh, Dave, good. Dave, we have a, is this, is this a call for Pat on uh, the line that's blinking? I don't know. Uh, I thought she told me it was, and we'll see. Okay, just a minute, she says. We'll see. Is this for Pat? Okay. Okay. Were you at the races in 41? Hello, go ahead, please. Uh, it was much before that, and I can remember as a child uh, seeing harness races at the fairground. Yeah, they had harness races and horse races, too. Uh, but that was way before 41. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember the dog race. Don't remember the dog race. Because I was certainly around in 41. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of us were too. <laughs> oh, Perky, I wasn't. Oh, you weren't here in 41? Oh, mercy. No. But you don't remember anything about the dog races, but you remember about the horse and harness racing. Right. 
Okay, well, thank you for calling. Thank you. Uh, well, thank we're you. still looking for information I'm on the dog race. This is in 41. Okay. At one point in the 1800s, the fairgrounds were southeast of the reformatory. Southeast of the reformatory. About yeah. where? Just southeast of the reformatory. <laughs> it, was, it shows on an 1886 map. Uh -huh. uh, there were two well-known businessmen here. And they referred to them as the Vincent Brothers. They bought the fairgrounds and said, if you want to have agricultural fairs, okay, but no more horse races. They took matters into their own hands. So we're back to the scandals in the Gray House. Excuse me, White House. <laughs> George Washington, and I, I have a feeling everybody knows this one but me, but I hadn't read it before. And I looked him up, 1789 to, to uh, 1797. He very unselfishly declined a salary for being president, but he did agree to accept an expense account. And he submitted receipts such as $8,000 for laundry, $3,000 for wine, and $35,000 for transportation. But no salary. But no salary. Well, it'd be like some people now, they, they wouldn't have to pay taxes on those kind of expenses, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, John F. Kennedy. One time he was asked by a reporter if there was any truth at all to the allegation that he had bought the election. So he said it just a happenstance, he'd just gotten a telegram from his generous daddy, and he pulled a piece of paper out of his pocket, and he pretended to read, quote, Dear Jack, don't buy one more vote than you absolutely need. I'll be darned if I'll pay for a landslide. <laughs> of course, that's a joke. Yes, that one's a joke. Uh -huh. This particular article commented on, on a lot of the things that he was confronted with, that he showed a great deal of a sense of humor when he dealt with them. Well, with his daddy, with the background that he had, I imagine he was confronted about... Yeah, you haven't got Truman in there. Well, you tell Truman. I don't know all about Truman and the Pendergrass gang, but I would think that that would have been a, one of your highlights there that you have had on what he was involved in, and yet... Well, yeah, this article didn't have Truman in it. it. It had others than the ones that I took down, but it mm -hmm. didn't particularly have Truman either. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Maybe somebody wants to call in and, and hang one on Truman here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that most all presidents, well, I guess all of us, if we were running for that high of office, I, I don't know what kind of backgrounds all of us have, you know, that they would pick up Oh, something. heavens, we all have skeletons in our closet I'm of some sure, sort or another. I'm sure we do, or our families do. Sure. And, uh, they would really have a heyday, I know, with some. Well, we have a couple mi more minutes, Pat. Do you have something short and sweet we can get into this morning? How about, uh, this is from I Promised Recipes from the Cottage Physician. Okay. This would be a short one. Now, this book was printed in 1899. It's a flea market find. And uh, in that period in history, the mineral waters, like Eureka Springs, Arkansas, were widely sought after. People would travel just to drink it there and take bottles of it home and so on. And in this particular section of this book, uh, doctors had supposedly analyzed these mineral waters, and they had different kinds that they told what they contained. Um... They said, quote, medical properties and healing virtues highly, highly endorsed by eminent physicians throughout the land. One was called, which I thought was funny, Congress water. <laughs> and it had calcined or calcined magnesia, bicarbonate soda, hydrate of soda, common salt, and pure spring water. There was one Carlsbad water. There was one Kissingen water, which was bicarbonate of soda, carbonate, carbonate of lime, and two scruples. Now... I think scruples is a measuring type uh, instrument, but I thought scruples under Congress water wouldn't have hurt. <laughs> but we had, we had a bottler here that later on had Bennett Mineral and Distilled Water. And this was Colonel Bennett. And when he first came, he made a product called Lactose Tonic. And there was an ad in the July 3rd, 1888 paper that gave his recipe. It was made from corn, oats, hops, and dandelions from an old German formula, added to syrup of milk sugar, and he promised that daily use would eradicate every species of indigestion and prevent kidney trouble. And he observed that everyone who substitutes lactose tonic for lager bill and beer and alcoholic drinks does a wise thing. He was at 406 North Main then. Well, I imagine that we could substitute that mineral water for that liquor today. We'd all we be probably there. would, yes. Well, Pat, it looks like we're into the last minute here of the show, uh, historically speaking, with Pat Mitchell, and we really have appreciated and been interested in, in hearing all the things. Uh, you can uh, write Pat a note here at the station or pass along information uh, just by saying it here to KWW, Pat Mitchell. We'll be glad to see that she gets it. And then, of course, next Tuesday morning again. At 10.30, as part of the party line on Tuesdays, she will be back with on Historically Speaking. If you have 
suggestions on things you'd like for her to look up or to discuss, or if you have additions for her or questions, why, you can write to her in between, and we'll be sure that she gets them. And, and of course, uh, we will welcome your calls at any time that we're on with this program. We want to thank you very much for being with us.